Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Well, good evening. Well, we're in 2 Kings chapter 1, and as we announced that and people were clapping, I'm thinking, what other church claps for an introduction to the book of 2 Kings? So, I applaud you in my heart. No, I'll just actually applaud you for making the applause. 2 Kings chapter 1 and 2, um, Lord willing. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for answering our prayers. You are a God who loves when we depend upon you, when we admit we need you. And when we voice that to you, you are so present, a present help in times of trouble. And Father, we ask that your spirit would open our hearts to receive now from your word. Strengthen us to hear, to understand, uh, to rejoice in the principles that are behind the narrative itself. And pray that because of it, we would grow in grace and in knowledge. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps the darkest period of our history as America was the Civil War. It was a nation divided. It was so bad that experts, historians, estimate the number of lives lost during the Civil War was as much as the lives lost in subsequent wars that America fought all put together. It drove Abraham Lincoln, the president at that time, to his knees many times. How do you deal with a nation divided? He went through several generals, they say up to 12 generals during that time, and his heart was broken because of it. We are examining in 2 Kings, still, the divided nation of Israel. We saw it divide in the previous book. David had been king, Solomon was the king after Solomon. Jeroboam and Rehoboam took two different parts of the kingdom, one north and one south. It has been divided since. It remains divided in this book, but it will go from just a divided nation to a collapsed, captive nation by the end of this book. It's a very, very sad tale. The setting of this book is 930 B.C. Second Kings covers about three centuries of history of north and south. Eventually, the northern ten tribes will go into captivity. Now remember, the ten northern tribes went into captivity first. 722 B.C., the ten northern tribes are taken captive by the Assyrians. Another 150 years will elapse. God will be gracious to the southern kingdom. They last a little bit longer. But in 586 B.C., the Babylonians will take captive the southern kingdom of Judah. And when they take captive the southern kingdom of Judah, and you'll read about it by the end of 2 Kings, they also take captive the entire world. It's not like Babylon is a, a, a superpower alongside of the Assyrians. They will assume control over the whole world. They will become, if you remember the statue in the book of Daniel, the head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, a world-encompassing, world-governing empire. That's how the book will end. But throughout the book, it is a divided nation. 
And there's a, a cast of kings. We've been talking about politicians last week and kings over the weeks. Hard to keep track of all their names. And it's going to get harder, you'll see tonight, because we come into a situation where the king in the north and the king in the south, for a period of time, have the exact same name. So it's like, well, good luck keeping track with that. But for the most part, the kings are bad leaders. 20 kings in the north, all bad. 19 kings in the south, Judah, eight of them are good, the rest of them are bad. So it's sort of like watching American Idol. You have a few outstanding performers and the rest are really bad. The rest of these kings are really bad. You have eight outstanding performers in terms of good kings, and they're all down in Judah. So we have a narrative, but then we have a meta-narrative. So the narrative is corrupt human leadership. But the meta-narrative is God's overarching leadership. So you have kings ruling on earth, but you have the king overruling from heaven. And both of these themes run through the book, and here is why. The, the real meta-narrative of 2 Kings is how God preserves a messianic genealogy in the midst of corruption, sin, failure, attacks, division, God is going to preserve for David a progeny so that one day the son of David, the government will be upon his shoulders. And 2 Kings shows us sort of the magic behind the scenes of how God is preserving that messianic kingdom. So we're going to see the failure of man and the overarching faithfulness of God. There's a lesson just in that for us in looking at the big scope. And, and that is that our sin may be forgiven in an instant. And it is, by the way, when you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. There's not a sin you can't commit or that you can commit that God won't forgive if you ask him to forgive you. And forgiveness happens in an instant. But the consequences of your sin may last a lifetime. The consequences aren't removed even though the punishment ultimately is removed and you are forgiven. If I went out and got drunk and you have really nothing to worry about, because that ain't going to happen. But if that did happen, if I got drunk tonight and I was outside and wandering around the neighborhood and bumping into stuff and walked out on the street and got hit by a car and asked the man who hit me for forgiveness for creating such a horrible circumstance for his life and his family, he has to live with my broken leg, or knowing that he ran into another human being, he would forgive me, but I'd still have a broken leg and a limp for a long period of time. Forgiveness can happen in an instant. Consequences last, and sometimes they last a long time, and that, that comes out in this book. As it says in Galatians 6, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. And so the thing about that law, that's a spiritual law, sowing and reaping, is that you sow seed into the ground and you reap a crop. But typically, you reap far more than you sow. If you look at it proportionally, you have a bag of seed, but if you were to collect all that comes from that seed, you have far more that is produced in terms of volume than you have sown. So, Yes, you reap what you sow, but tragically, sometimes we reap far more than we sow. And yet, 
Let's go right back to the meta-narrative. God is faithful. God pursues us. God doesn't give up on us. God chases us, and God has a plan. And that comes through loud and clear uh, in this book of 2 Kings. So it's going to be a, a pretty cool book to get through. Now, the nation is sick. The heart of the nation is sick. The heart is divided. You might say the nation has suffered a heart attack. And so God sends two defibrillators. One is named Elijah, and the other is named Elisha. And that's how the book begins. The ministry of the prophet defibrillator number one, Elijah, is ending. And as it is ending, the ministry of Elisha, the second defibrillator, is just beginning. Now, we sometimes get these names confused, and I brought this up a few weeks ago. You know, so we in English have to be very emphatic in our pronunciation and say Elijah versus Elisha. And that's because we've anglicized the Hebrew. If you and I spoke Hebrew, it wouldn't be a problem. We would say Eliyahu and Elisha, and they sound very different, do they not? But we won't be saying Eliyahu and Elisha. We'll just be saying Elijah and Elisha because we're English speakers, so we just have to kind of live with that impediment. Verse 1, Moab, which is a country just east of the Dead Sea, modern-day Jordan, Moab, rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Ahab, the king in the north, has died, remember. Whenever a king dies, other nations look for weak spots and think, ah, we have weak leadership now. If there's weak leadership in that nation, let's make some moves. Always happens. Always happens. It's happening today. Happens across the globe. And so nations are looking for their opportunity to take back the land or to make a move locally without suffering some kind of blowback from it. Moab did that after Ahab died. Now, Ahaziah, Ahaziah, you might remember, maybe not, he was the son of Ahab who is now in charge after his dad Ahab died. Ahaziah is the king of the ten northern tribes of Israel. Ahaziah fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and was injured, so he sent messengers to them. And this is what he said. Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. Here's the setting. A typical Middle Eastern balcony upstairs patio that took place on the upper level had a lattice, had a grate around it, a covering, a wooden covering. It, it was great for um, letting the breeze blow through. Uh, it was, it was uh, great uh, for, um, uh, um, I, I don't know the word I'm trying to think of, but it was, it's great for uh, convenience. It's very bad for security. And it's just lightweight wood, and he fell through it, and he got injured. And so, in his injury, he, he turns to God, but he turns to the wrong God. Isn't it interesting how when people get sick, they get suddenly religious. When we get hurt, when we're suffering, suddenly we, we cry out to God. And we should. But we shouldn't cry out to God only when we're sick. And sometimes I wonder if the Lord allows difficulties just because he hasn't heard from us for a while. And then, oh, God, and God says, hey, man, I haven't heard from you in a month. Great to hear from you. How you been? So he cries out. Now, God does use sickness many times to draw unbelievers to himself. I have seen this. And this would have been an opportunity for him to turn to God Yahweh, the true God of Israel. But he doesn't. He'll harden his heart against God, 
And in effect, what he is saying to Yahweh by saying, call on Beelzebub and ask him if I'm going to get better, is he is like putting a fist in the air to Yahweh saying, I defy you. And here's why I say that. The name Ahaziah indicates that he at least had some kind of superficial knowledge of God or at least background with Yahweh. The name Ahaziah means Yahweh or God holds. God grasps. And so the name basically means God's got you, man. He's holding on to you. The problem with Ahaziah is he wasn't grabbing onto God. So he was a believer in name only. He is indeed a practical atheist. Do you know what a practical atheist is? A practical atheist is really the worst form of blasphemer. It's somebody who says he has a name of God, a name of Christian. I'm a Christian man, I believe in God, but he lives his life as though God doesn't exist. No thought of God, no prayer for direction of God. He'll only name the name of God. I'm on this team, I've been raised in this church, I'm part of a Christian family, I'm a Christian. But he or she lives their life as though God doesn't exist. That's the worst kind of blasphemy. And that was Ahaziah. He had the right name, but he said, go inquire of Beelzebub. Beelzebub means the Lord of the flies. Down in Philistine country in Ekron, about 40 miles away, one of the chief gods that was worshipped was a fly. Crazy, right? But people will worship all sorts of crazy things when they reject the true God. I, I get amazed at the kinds of things people resort to. Once they have forsaken the true and living God, they'll do just about... They're, now they're, they're open to anything, any kind of deception. You know, I was always taught that the natural world abhors a vacuum. I also believe the supernatural world abhors a vacuum. And when God is taken away, suddenly you need something to put in his place, and you'll believe in anything. Open to a lie. So they're worshiping the Lord of the flies, a bug, and precisely a dung beetle. So... Your imagination can run with that one. By the time we get to the New Testament, the name Beelzebub is a name that was commonly used for Satan. But it derives from this Philistine god Baal or Beelzebub, the Lord of. Baal is a generic term for Lord, Lord of the flies. So go talk to the fly god and see if I'll get better. Well, God's about to pull out the fly swatter. <laughs> Look at verse 3. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite. Now, you've got to stop. I'm going to sorry about this, but do you remember the previous book, 2 Kings? When, when God wanted to speak to Elijah, just as the Lord spoke to Elijah. Suddenly, we have a change here. The angel of the Lord is involved with Elijah. It's not the Lord personally, it's the angel, and it's not an angel of the Lord, but it's a very specific Old Testament terminology that shows up just a few times. It shows up with Abraham. The angel of the Lord appears to him at a terebinth tree in the heat of the day. The Lord with a couple of angels. But this person who obviously looks human and is able to sit down with Abraham is called the angel of the Lord, and later on he's called the Lord. He shows up in the book of Exodus, the burning bush, the angel of the Lord spoke. He shows up with Elijah, the angel of the Lord. And this is why many commentators, many Old Testament scholars, 
believe it's a construction that specifically is a reference to Jesus Christ. The pre-incarnate, before the incarnation at Bethlehem, a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ. Which brings up some interesting connotations because if the angel of, of the Lord is Jesus and shows up with Moses at the burning bush and then shows up with Elijah, it's interesting that all three show up later on when Jesus is transfigured on a high mountain in northern Israel. Jesus is transformed before the apostles with Moses and Elijah. You know, it's like they're giving high fives. Man, we've done this before. We've had meetings like this before. That's a possibility that the angel of the Lord, I'm not saying definitively, but uh, many believe that the angel of the Lord is indeed the Lord Jesus Christ. So the angel of the Lord of Yahweh said to Elijah the Tishbite, arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire? of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah departed. And when the messengers returned to him, he said to them, why have you come back? So he sent them 40 miles away. Ekron is 40 miles from Samaria. He figured it's going to be a while. They're on their way. Elijah meets them, gives them this message. They come back very quickly. He goes, what are you guys back so quickly for? He said, why have you come back? So they said, a man came to meet us and said to us, go return to the king who sent you and say to him, thus says the Lord, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Baals above the God of Ekron? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. He said to them, what kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you these words? Now, he had a hunch who it was. Is that, only, that sounds like one guy. My dad had trouble with this one guy. And this one guy was so bold. Who would be this bold? And he's thinking, it's probably that Elijah guy. So he said, what did he look like? And they said, he was a hairy man. And he wore a leather belt around his waist. And he said, it's Elijah the Tishbite. It says he was a hairy man. In Hebrew, literally, it's he was a possessor of hair. Now, it could mean a couple things. It could mean he had kind of wild hair, a lot of hair on his head. He was bewhiskered as well, having a pretty gnarly beard. Right, That sort of fits our mental image of him. It could also refer to the fact that he was wearing animal skins and they were cinched together with this leather belt. That, that describes him. It is Elijah the Tishbite. Then the king sent to him, to Elijah, a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So he went up to him, and there he was sitting on top of a hill. A quick note about Elijah. He confronted the kings. Of course, he heard from the Lord. He also was wise himself in spiritual matters. He had what we would call today discernment. Discernment. And here he is now at an old age, like he was when he was younger, unafraid to say, that's wrong, and I'm calling you on it. That's evil, and I'm calling you on it. 
That's not right, and I want you to know why it's not right. And he could discern right from wrong, good from bad, righteousness from evil. In the New Testament, there is a gift called the gift of discernment. It's a vital gift in the body of Christ. Of course, every believer should have a level of discernment. Jesus said to all of us, to his disciples then, as well as to us disciples now, beware of false prophets. And they'll come to you in sheep's clothing. They'll look and sound and smell like sheep, but they're wolves. Watch out for them. And, and, and we are warned, generally as believers, to be able to discern between right and wrong, good and evil, truth and error. But there is a special gift called the spiritual gift of discerning of spirits. Remember that term by Paul, the discernment of spirits. It's one of the graces or gifts of the Holy Spirit that makes any local church strong and healthy, vibrant. To have somebody who can function in the body of Christ like the liver functions in your own body. You know, your liver filters out toxins, poisons. And, you know, you can, you know, you can live without a kidney. You can live without a leg or an arm. You can live without a lung. You cannot live without your liver. That filtration system is important. Someone with discernment, and I'll put that in the classification of apologetics ministry, is like the liver in the body of Christ. A theologian is like the liver in the body of Christ. He puts a fine point on doctrinal truth and says, that's not quite right, actually, and, and this is important stuff. You know, a lot of go, ah, who cares about that kind of stuff? We should care. Because otherwise, we're open to being deceived. But here's the problem with the gift of discernment. Like Elijah, you often stand alone. It's so clear to you. It's so obvious that that's wrong, but not everybody else gets it. They'll just come along and say, oh, come on, overlook it. That guy's so sweet and well-meaning. He's wonderful. And you go, no, he's not. He's a charlatan. I had roommates in Santa Ana, in a bad part of Santa Ana, in the place where lots of gunfights went on in Santa Ana, you know, sort of like Albuquerque. <laughs> and uh, we would see all sorts of people come up and down the streets and and we would often bring them into the house. I had two other roommates. And one night, this guy came in who claimed to be a believer. And he looked so sweet. And, and my roommates were bringing him in and saying, oh, this guy's a brother. And I was listening. And I took them aside. And I said, we're kicking him out. They said, kicking him out. He goes, that guy's a fake. I just know it. I'm listening to him. Something's not right. So I went to him. And I said, you're out of here. Well, it was raining outside. He goes, you wouldn't kick a guy out in the rain, would you? I said, I would. He said, how can you, as a child of God, do that? I said, I'll risk it. Get out. I kicked him out. They thought I was heartless. Found out the next day from our local church that I was a part of, Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, that this guy was a charlatan and was hitting up different places in town taking money from people in the, in the evening, in the night, and getting off with it. So when you, or if you have the gift of discernment, you know what it's like. It's awfully frustrating to have that gift because you see it clearly. You're the Elijah going, this guy's so wrong. And everybody else going, yeah, well, you know, every, one person believes one thing, another believes the other. So he says, well, dude, you're going to die. So... Um, the king's going to do something now about that. The king, Ahaziah. Verse 9, the king sent to him a captain of 50 with 50 men. So you got 51 guys, right? Captain and his 50. So he went up to him, and there he was, sitting on top of a hill. There's Elijah, top of the hill. And he spoke to him, man of God, the king has said, come down. 
So Elijah answered and said to the captain of the, of the 50, if I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. So, poof, crispy critters, all 51. And he sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50 men. See, um, again, I know I don't want to be too hard on politicians, but it is, it is the leaders of countries who, who commit their troops to war. And, and this king, in his pride, is committing his troops in harm's way. Uh, even though 50 have been blotted out, you send 50 more. What do I care? He sent another captain of 50 and 50 men, and he answered and said to him, Man of God, um, and he adds a fine point on it, Thus has the king said, Come down quickly. He adds the quickly now. So Elijah answered and said to them, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Now this fire falling from heaven was sort of one of Elijah's trademarks, right? On Mount Carmel, fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifices. So there's a hundred men down. But I just want to give you a little FYI. You wouldn't get this just by reading it in the English text. In the Hebrew language in which this text is written, there's a play on words. In Hebrew, the word for man is the word ish. Ish is a man. Isha is woman. Ish is man. The word for fire in Hebrew is the word esh. So he's saying, ish of God, come down. When in reality, the esh of God came down. That's the play on words. In the Hebrew, it's pretty plain. And it's just there to make the impact, this play on words. So again, he sent a third captain of 50 with his 50 men, and the third captain of the 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and pleaded with him and said to him, Man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. He's a smart man. He saw what happened. Two strikes have already happened. He's the third guy at bat. Game over if he strikes it out. So he just humbles himself. Please, I'm a family man. I've got mouths to feed at home. Spare the lives of these 50 servants. Look, fire has come down from heaven and burned up the first two captains of 50s with their 50s. But let my life now be precious in your sight. Now, do you remember in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 9, Jesus and his men are on their way to Jerusalem. And they stop by this area, Samaria. Same area. And... The disciples are remembering some of the stories in the Old Testament. They remember this whole Elijah thing. And, and what they notice is that the Samaritans are not receiving the message of Jesus. So two of the disciples, James and John, said, Hey, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven like Elijah did and just post-toasty these guys? And Jesus said, Man, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. The Son of Man did not come to destroy lives, but to save them. That is so Old Testament, you guys. This is New Testament. The law came by Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Different thing going on here. Stop that. Verse 15, And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. 
So he arose and went down with him to the king. And then he said to him, Thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire of the fly dude, fly god, Beelzebub, god of Ekron, is it because there's no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Can I just say something about that? This question is a question to ponder. Is it because there's no God available to you that you are calling on false gods going after false things? Is, is there no God in, in the land to, to call on? It breaks God's heart when we chase after other things for help and not chase after him for help. He really loves us to depend on him. And of course you can go to other things and use other means in your life. Be practical, but first go to him. Ask him for wisdom. Lean on him. Pray to him as first recourse. And he says, therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken because he had no son. Jehoram became king in his place. And in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. Now notice that. Jehoram became king in his place. And also notice, in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. So you've got two Jehorams reigning, one in the north, one in the south. One is the son of Ahab, the other is the son of Jehoshaphat, both the same name. Okay, so it's like you got John and John. That's not uh, too difficult to understand. Uh, they're just using the same ancient name. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And it came to pass, when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. We have a little problem because there's two different Gilgals. There's the Gilgal down by the Jordan River when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River with Joshua. Remember that? When the river opened up, the whole company came into the land. Before they attacked Jericho, they camped at this little desert outcropping called Gilgal, means circle. There was also a Gilgal up by Bethel. And either one would be appropriate. I couldn't tell you which is which, just one of the Gilgals. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. Now, because the chapter opens up by saying it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven, it seems that it was becoming common knowledge that the Lord was about to end the ministry of Elijah and do something with him, like take him away or get him killed or something. It was the end. Elisha is aware of that. You'll see other prophets in the area are also aware of that. It's just becoming common knowledge. This is the end of Elisha's ministry. So because of that, Elijah said to Elisha, you stay here because God has called me to go to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Dude, I am not leaving you. I'm sticking to you like Velcro, like white on rice. You know, if you're going to leave, I'm going to be there when it happens. I'm going to be there to get the blessing when it happens. Verse 3, And the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you today? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Don't bring it up. I don't want to talk about it. Yes, I know it's the end, but I love him. He's my master. He's my mentor. He's my leader. 
I know about it, but zip it. Don't want to hear about it. Keep silent. Keep quiet. A word about the sons of the prophets. In the Old Testament, starting with the prophet Samuel, they, there became groups called the schools of the prophets. That was a company of young men sort of learning ministry, learning the word of the Lord. The priesthood had become corrupt. God was raising up a few notable prophets, and they were training other young men in the ministry. We would be, they'd be like seminary students today. So it began with Samuel, continued with Elijah, continued with Elisha. They would watch the prophets, they would listen to them. It was OJT, on-the-job training. And Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. So they went up to Bethel. Now he's going down to Jericho. But look again, as the Lord lives, he says, as your soul lives, I'm not going to leave you. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master um, from over you today? And he answered, yes, I know. Shut up. Keep silent. Quit bringing it up. Then Elisha said to him, Elijah said to him, see, even I do that. Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. And he says, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I'm not going to leave you. So the two of them went on. You may get the idea that Elijah is trying to dump Elisha. It kind of looks like, hey, can you like bug off, you know I mean? I mean, you are like following me a little too close. You're like in my space. Could you like back off and just stay here? He goes, no, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to follow you. And I think, I don't think he was trying to dump him. I think he was giving him a test. A test of perseverance. Because um, it's going to be hard if you're going to be in the ministry. It's going to be hard. Let me give you a few tests. I'm going to go here. You stay here. No, I'll go with you. Okay, come on. Well, now, you know, I'm going to go somewhere else. You stay here. No, I'm coming with you. I think he's just throwing down the gauntlet of a test, and each one he is passing. Verse 7, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle. Remember what that mantle is? It's a cape that he wore. It was a symbol of authority of a prophet. He had thrown it. Back in chapter 19, he had thrown it on Elisha, designating him as the guy who will take over for him. Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided. So the Jordan River was divided this way and that, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. He took his cloth mantle, or animal skin, whatever it was, kind of rolled it up, turned it into more like, a, like of a stick or a rod, kind of like what Moses did when he stretched out his rod and opened up the Red Sea. He did that with his cloth, opened up the Jordan River, struck the water, it was divided. And so it was, verse 9, when they crossed over, that Elijah said to Elijah, ask... What may I do for you before I am taken away from you? I love the graciousness of this old prophet who instead of saying, you know, I'm getting old. There's a few things I'd like you to do for me. He says, what can I do for you? How can I minister to you and bless you? It's a beautiful heart. And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. You see, now that's a bold request because Elijah was pretty powerful. Elijah was pretty effective. Elijah had made quite an impact to come up to this guy who had this impact, this influence, this power and say, I want a double portion. You say, wow, that's kind of brash. 
and bold. And in reading that, you may get a confused interpretation as though Elisha was asking for twice as much power or twice as much effectiveness because it says double portion. But that's not really what he's asking for. He's not saying, you know what, you've done a pretty good job, Elijah, but I'd like to do like twice as much as you ever did. And let me explain it to you. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 21. In De Deuteronomy 21, in verse 15, if a man has two wives, one, now, I could try to un unravel that. First of all, a man shouldn't have two wives. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, singular, not wives, plural. It was never God's intention that polygamy existed, but it did exist. So because it did exist, God accompanying their sinfulness said, if a man has two wives, one is loved and the other is unloved, if they have borne him children, both the loved and the unloved, and if the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, then it shall be on the day he bequeaths his possessions to his sons that he must not bestow firstborn status on the son of the loved wife in preference of the son of the unloved who is truly the firstborn, but he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved as the firstborn by giving him a double portion in the inheritance of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So Elisha is saying to Elisha, let me be like your firstborn son. Let me have the inheritance of your ministry. Let me be your successor. That's the idea. Let me be your successor. Let me have the inheritance of the ministry that God has given you. So when he's asking for a double portion, he's asking, let me take over for you and have the inheritance of the ministry that you have been to this nation. It's, it's a similar truth when Jesus made a promise to his disciples. And he said, you see the works that I have done? Greater works shall you do because I go to the Father. Now, does that mean that we're going to raise more people from the dead than Jesus did? How many of you have raised anyone from the dead? Show of hands. Yeah, that's what I thought. Same, same here. So 40 miracles are recorded. Just 40 miracles are recorded in the New Testament. There probably were more because it says there were more. So when it says greater works, does that mean we're going to have more miracles, more shows of power? No, the idea is, is um, not greater power as much as greater extent. Jesus was in one place at one time. He said, I'm going to the Father, and when I go to the Father, the Holy Spirit is going to be sent in all of you. And you're going to go out into all the world. And so think about the disciples and how the Lord multiplied through the evangelism of the disciples. Think of the 3,000 saved by just Peter's preaching on Pentecost. Think of the first 300 years of church history when large swaths of the entire Roman Empire converted to Christ. And that's what it means when Jesus said, greater work shall you do. So the work of Christ is multiplied through his disciples. So Elisha said, I want, I want a double portion. I want to be a, the successor. I want to carry on your work uh, in Israel. Verse 10. So he said, you've asked a hard thing. When somebody comes to me and says, I want to be in the ministry. Really? You've asked a hard thing. 
I'm reminded of what Charles Haddon Spurgeon would say to young men who said, Mr. Spurgeon, I want to be in the ministry. And he would say to them, if, if you can be content doing anything else but ministry, do it. For God's sake, do it. But if you cannot be content and you only must do that, only then do it. My pastor, Chuck Smith, used to be like this. We would come up to him and say, Chuck, I feel called to the ministry. He'd go, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Oh, it's pretty tough. I mean, he would discourage some of us. And, and I remember asking him, well, Chuck, why do you discourage people who want to serve the Lord? He said, if I can discourage them, they're not called. There will be plenty of real life discouragements through their life that will shut them down. The modern statistics, the present day statistics, the average pastor's tenure in a church, I've told you this before, is between four and five years. It's about all they last. They just, for a number of reasons, shut down. So he says to Elisha, you're asking a tough thing, hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. He didn't die. See, wait a minute. It's appointed in every man to die once. True. But there are exceptions to that rule. Some people have died twice. Lazarus died. Jesus rose him from the dead. And then he died again later on. Anybody that was resurrected like that died two times. There are exceptions to every man dies once. And here's one exception. He didn't die. There's somebody else in the Old Testament who didn't die. Who is that? Enoch. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Just took him up to heaven. Raptured him. Elijah got raptured, but slowly, in a chariot of fire. Now, he'll be back. Don't worry. He'll be back. He shows up in the Gospels on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Jesus. He's there, Elijah is there. I also believe he shows up in Revelation chapter 11 because it talks about two witnesses and the powers that they have sound like the same kind of activities that Moses and Elijah were able to do. It says they're able to stop the rain during the time of their prophecy, like Elijah. They're able to call fire down from heaven, like Elijah. They're able to turn the waters into blood, like Moses. So it's my personal belief that in the tribulation period, the two witnesses that God sends to the nation of Israel are Moses and Elijah. And from what I know in Judaism, those are the two best witnesses God could send. They, the two men revered the most in Judaism. The head of the law is Moses, the head of the prophets, Elijah. The representative of the law and the prophets speaking during that time to the nation of Israel will result in 144,000 of them recognizing Jesus Christ as Messiah. So he'll be back. Bye, Elijah. See you later. By the way, Malachi says he'll be back. I will send you Elijah. Malachi chapter 3 says, Before the great and notable day of the Lord to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, that, I believe, is fulfilled in Revelation chapter 11. So, when your Jewish friend at Passover keeps a chair at the table uh, open for Elijah, use that to tell him that story of when he's going to show up, how he showed up in the New Testament, and when he's going to come again. Now, let's see. Where did I leave off? 12. And now, Elijah saw it and cried out. 
My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces, mourning the loss of his mentor. He also took up the mantle, that cape of Elijah that had fallen from him, went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Just, a, we, we have time, a quick fine point on the going up of, the, of Elijah in the whirlwind in a chariot. And the whirlwind literally is the storm. Elijah going up into heaven in a chariot of fire served as a polemic against Baal worship. A polemic is evidence that is amassed against someone or something. So Baal was called the rider of the storms. He controlled the weather. He rode upon the clouds, rode upon the storms. For Elijah to go up in the whirlwind, the storm, showed God's superiority over Baal. So this kind of vision that the prophets and this prophet Elisha saw served as a polemic to strengthen the future ministry of Elisha. Just a fine point to add to that, sort of an FYI. So uh, he took the mantle, stood by the banks of the Jordan, took the mantle of Elisha, and he struck the water, just like his mentor did, and said, where is the God of Elijah? Boy, that's a whole sermon I'd like to preach. Where is the God of Elijah? Where is the God of miracles? We ask that. People ask that. Where is the God of Peter? And where is the God of Paul? And where is the God of these mighty prophets? Where, where is such a God? It's a good question, but let me ask you maybe even a better question. Where are the Elijahs who call upon that God? Where are the Pauls and the Peters who dare to step out and be bold in faith? When those men show up by the grace of God, you will see with them the God of Elijah and Paul and Peter. Where is the Lord of Elijah? When he struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elijah crossed over. And when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elisha, Elijah rests on Elisha. So it was a confirming miracle for them. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Then they said to him, look now, there are 50 strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master, lest perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him on some mountain or in some valley. And he said, you shall not send anyone. He knew he'd gone up into heaven. They thought God took him up and like dropped him somewhere else. We got to find him. He said, forget it. Don't send anybody. But when they urged him until he was ashamed, so now he's second-guessing himself. Well, maybe, maybe God did dump him somewhere. He said, send him out. Therefore, they sent 50 men and searched for three days, but did not find him. That'll preach. When they came back to him, for he had stayed in Jericho, he said to them, Did I not say to you, don't go? Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Please notice the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new bowl. And he put salt in it. So they brought it to him. And he went out to the source of water and cast the salt there. And they said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water from it. There shall be no more death or barrenness. Water sources can become contaminated. With bacteria, viruses, things like Giardia, waterborne uh, bugs that you drink and you, you die. That happened in Jericho. He came and did something counterintuitive. Salt usually doesn't make things better when it comes to water. Salt water doesn't like, ooh, I can drink it now. It's salt water. Um, but in this case, 
Salt was also a purifying agent, and it's a miracle. God, through him, performed a miracle. Interesting, when you go to Jericho today, they will show you a spring bubbling out of the water. They call it still to this day the spring of Elisha. And they will often think back to the story how God healed the water in their territory. Jericho is a beautiful spot. A beautiful spot. It's a great place for a winter home. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a palm tree laden. It's called the City of Palms. Uh, you know, it's like Palm Springs. It's like Phoenix. That's why I say it's great for a winter home. You don't want to hang out in Jericho like in July. You know, you want to go up to Jerusalem where it's cooler. Enough said. And when he went up from there to Bethel, as he was going up the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him and said to him, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Hey, baldy, get out of here. So he turned around looked at them, pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord, and two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. Moral of the story, don't mess with a bald-headed man. No, that is not the moral of the story. <laughs> he came and went from there to Mount Carmel, and from there went to Samaria. We're out of time, and so uh, next week I'll explain the whole uh, issue of the bald-headed man and the bears. <laughs> Father, thank you for um, the stories that we read about these great men of faith. Uh, though they are peculiar stories, uh, they are, again, the scriptures that the disciples are Lord, the New Testament references, promises made about the coming of Elijah before the great day of the Lord, as the prophet Malachi pronounced, as even Jesus himself promised. So these are persons, Lord, that we are going to meet in the future. You have a future plan for them. And so we marvel, Lord, as, as Solomon himself said, there's really nothing new under the sun. What is new, Lord, is your ability to forgive. Though there may be consequences that we face, you're able to forgive in an instant, in a moment, to look at us when we confess our sins and say, you are white as snow, you are white as wool, you are my child. Lord, I pray that unlike Ahaziah, unlike Ahab, who refused to turn to you, that we would be quick to turn to you whenever there is any kind of ailment, any kind of bump in the road, that our immediate impulse would be to pray to the God of heaven and earth, the one who overrules even the evil in this world. We rest in you tonight, Lord. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.